Welcome to video two for week one. In the previous video, I defined as much as we could the extension of the indefinite integral. Now we're gonna define the extension of the definite integral. I'm gonna do this in a way that's similar to how we did a lot of our basic definitions in previous calculus courses. I'm gonna start with a conceptual definition in this course, what this should mean. In the videos that follow this, I'm gonna be talking about how to actually calculate these things. Because the conceptual definition is a good definition, it's formally what we need, it's logically what makes sense, but as with most of the conceptual definitions, it's very, very hard to work with. So now I wanna think about some subset of our n, I wanna think about a function on that subset, and say, what should the integral mean? Well, if this was a subset in, in one dimension, the integral in one dimension over an interval meant the area under that curve. This thing still has a graph. So the graph of a single variable function and the graph of multivariable function, these are different things. This thing has a graph in Rn plus one. So it has n inputs and one output. So it has a graph in Rn plus one. If this is a function of two variable, it has a graph in R3. And that graph has some stuff underneath it. It might be volume or hypervolume, but that graph, between that graph and the base level, the level of the domain, there's some volume. So this integral, I'm going to put a dv here to represent the idea that I have small pieces of volume over some open set u in Rn. This integral is going to be, by definition, the volume or hypervolume under the graph of this function, much like the definite integral conceptually for single variable functions is the area under the curve. So it's now instead of area under the curve, it's volume under the curve or hypervolume under the curve. The only difference in notation, this is going to be dv for volume or hypervolume. If I have a function of two variables, I'm going to write dA because the pieces that I work, the domain that I work over are going to be rectangles. They're going to have area instead of volume. So I want to use A to represent area. For three and more dimensions, I will use V to represent volume. But in any case, regardless of whether it's a function of two or more variables, it encloses a volume or hypervolume underneath it. And the size of that volume or hypervolume is going to be what this number is. The definite integral is going to calculate that volume or hypervolume. So this is a really nice extension. And in some ways, this is much cleaner than the extension we did of derivatives in Calculus 3, where there wasn't one single thing that matched the slope of a tangent line. We eventually did get normals to tangent hyperplanes, uh, but we had to sort of do a lot of work and go via partials to get there. Here, the concept actually extends a little bit more nicely. We just have whatever the stuff is under the graph instead of area, it's volume or hypervolume, the definite integral of a scalar field measures that. Now to get towards calculation, we actually have to restrict this a little bit. And I want to talk about these restrictions and what we're going to do with them. So the definite integral for single variable calculus works over an interval in R, in the real number line. We defined area under a graph between A and B. So that's the interval from A and B that gave us an area under a curve. I want to work the same way in Rn, so I want to define what an interval is in Rn, and it's going to be the geometric product of a bunch of these smaller intervals. So I want to define to you what this geometric product means. So if I write this notation here, I, this interval here, with this geometric product, so this times between it, this means that the first variable is going to be in this range, the second variable is going to be in this range, and then the last variable is going to be in this range. So these give me the ranges in each of the variables. And the variables are allowed to go in those ranges independently. And what this is going to give me is this is going to give me rectangles and rectangular prisms. So an interval in R2 is a rectangle where the x-coordinate goes from something to something, the y-coordinate goes from something to something, and I get this whole rectangle. The interval in R3 is going to be a rectangular prism. I can draw a rectangular prism where the x coordinate has some range, the y coordinate has some range, the z coordinate has some range. And in higher dimensions, it'll be the higher dimensional analogs. But it's always this rectangular thing. Each of the variables is independently bound between an upper and lower bound. And they give us the, these, these rectangles, the rectangular prism things with this notation. 
So the, these product signs, these are quite typical in geometry for these kind of constructions where I bound each of the variables by a certain range. Uh, this with these square brackets gives me the closed interval. So that's with the non-strict inequalities where I include the endpoints. I can also have an open interval where I don't include the endpoints. So if I were to draw that as a rectangle in R2, I would typically draw that with a dotted line to indicate that the edge of it is not included, much like an open interval in the real numbers does not include its endpoints. And I can also have any kind of mixture of these. So it could include this, include these, but not include any of these things that have uh, curve brackets instead of square brackets. All right, those give me an interval. Now that I have intervals, I can actually define the integral more formally in terms of calculation using the same definition that I used for single variable calculus. We called that the Riemann integral. So the integral for single variables was the limit as the number of subdivisions goes to infinity. This should be an infinity. Um, the count over those subdivisions, the value of xk star of something on those subdivisions multiplied by the width of those subdivisions. And that was the single variable integral. So now I have an interval, which is this rectangle or rectangular prism thing. And the setup is exactly the same. So the integral of the function over that interval, I now have a subset here, i, instead of going from a to b, since I have a whole bunch of these different things, I just put i in the subscript. It's going to be the same setup. So I'm going to have a bunch of subdivisions of this interval. I'm going to subdivide it into a bunch of pieces. The number of pieces is actually going to be k to the n, because I'm going to subdivide each piece into k. I'm going to subdivide this into k, this into k, and this into k. If I think about a rectangle, I'm going to subdivide it this way, and I'm going to subdivide it this way, and I get k squared pieces. If I do a three-dimensional thing, I'll subdivide it three ways. I'll get k cubed pieces. So I need to count many more pieces, because I need to subdivide in all of the dimensions. So I count up to k to the n. x l star is something in each of those pieces, so in each of these subdivisions, I choose a value. I evaluate the function at that value. I've got some little piece of volume or area, so that'll be the area of each of these pieces, the same way that this was the width of each of the subdivisions. So this would be the area or volume of each of the pieces, area in R2 and volume in R3, hypervolume higher. And so this is going to give me a rectangle, rectangular prism-like thing that measures a little piece of the approximate volume or hypervolume underneath the graph. And then I just add up all of these things together um, and then take the limit as the number of subdivisions goes to infinity. It's more complicated. There's a lot more to keep track of. There's a lot of tricky pieces in this, but the idea is essentially the same, is that I still am dividing up the interval into subintervals. I'm doing an approximation by choosing some x star in each of the subintervals, evaluating the function on it, multiplying by the area or volume of the subintervals, adding those up to get an approximation, and taking the limit as the approximation process gets more and more refined. It's just as unwieldy as the original Riemann integral, and we'll get into ways to get around its calculation problems, much like we did before in the next video. But this really is formally what's going on. I want to talk about what kind of functions can be integrated. So the limit that I had on the previous slide may not be defined. Not all those Riemann, Riemann limits work. And this was true for single variable functions as well as multivariable functions. Functions where that limit is defined on a certain interval are called integrable functions. And I could work with a full category of integrable functions. But there's a lot of really strange integrable functions that the limit still does work for, but are not terribly reasonable, in, reasonable things to work with. So I want to work with a slightly smaller but more convenient class of functions. And these are the functions that we're going to integrate in this course. And these are piecewise continuous functions. We talked about the continuity of functions in Calculus 3. So let me just remind you what a piecewise continuous function is on an interval. So let's say if I have a closed interval, and I have a function on that interval to the real numbers. Well, say I can split that interval up into a number of subintervals. And these are not necessarily uh, the subdivisions of the previous slide where I subdivide them like this. Instead, this could be a subdivision of interval into this interval and those two intervals. So I'd have one, two, and three pieces. 
And if f is continuous in each of those pieces, but maybe it's discontinuous on the on the boundaries where they meet up with each other, then it's called piecewise continuous. So it may have some kind of jump over here, it may have some kind of jump over here, but on each of these three pieces, it's continuous, then it's called piecewise continuous. And piecewise continuous functions are always integrable. So if I need to prove something, I need to work with some integrable functions, if I need to know that that Riemann limit is defined, I'm not going to work with the full class of integrable functions. I'll just work with the class of piecewise continuous functions, and that'll be good enough for the properties of this course. Lastly, the definite integral has a bunch of familiar properties. It is linear, so if I have a constant, I can pull the constant out. If I have a sum of two integral functions on the interval or two piecewise continuous functions, I can split it up. If a functions have an inequality, the integral has the same inequality. And if I have two intervals that match up, sort of overlap, but don't have any uh, overlap that has any area, then the integral of the union of these two is the integral is the sum of the two integrals. Now I have to avoid overlap. If I have two things like this, then I could end up counting this twice. So in this union, I mean this only works if I and J don't actually overlap with each other. And those are the formal properties of the integrals, the things that we need to define formally. In the next video, we're going to move on to calculation.